Good evening. Tonight I'm going to show you how you can write code that is more elegant, much easier to understand, and that does not rely on loops. So of course loops are very useful. Um, you, in many situations you need to repeat the exact same procedure, function, or list of functions or whatever on many many different uh, inputs. So it could th these inputs could be files, could be models, could be data sets could be anything. So it's very useful to know how to write loops and how to use them. However, I think there is a much easier and more elegant way. And um, writing elegant code is, is useful not only uh, because uh, it's much easier to understand, but it's also easier to debug. And you don't need, in my view, when you write very elegant code, to write as many comments, So which is also nice. So let's uh, look at the problem we're trying to solve here. So I have this um, I have this five five Excel workbooks that I took from the Enron corpus. So the Enron corpus is this uh, corpus of uh, emails and Excel sheets that um, were put together uh, when the American oil company Enron went under. And this was released on the internet, so you can Google Enron Corpus and you can play around with it. It's very nice for um, NLP if you want, you can use the emails and for network analysis and these kinds of things. And in our case, we have all these nice Excel sheets, uh, which we can also study. So in my case, what I want to do, I want to, so of course, there's thousands, I don't know how many exactly, but this probably thousands of Excel sheets. I only took five for the purposes of this video. And what I want to do is I want to count how many formulas there are in each of these workbooks. So to do that, I will use R because you can do that programmatically, which is very nice. First things first, I'm going to load my packages. So uh, the usual suspects, tidyverse, and in this case, tidy Excel. Uh, I'm going to uh, list my files, so I actually did that before, and if I look at my files, I have this, maybe let me zoom a little bit, I have this very nice uh, named, very, very, very nicely named Excel sheets. So apparently two of them were made by a person called Benjamin Rogers, and du Dutch, quickly, Dutch, is that a name, Dutch? Okay, great. Anyway, um, so first of all, when you try to solve this type of thing, just do it for one file. Start with one file. So in my case, I would do um, XLX cells, which is the tidy Excel function that reads in complex Excel sheets. And you, you will see why I'm using that and not the uh, more uh, standard um, read Excel. You will see that in a bit. Actually, let me first of all do ahead of that. So what happens when you use this nice XLS X cells function is that the whole workbook gets read into R as a very nice data frame where you have a column called cheat sheet where which gives you the uh, the sheet name. So if there are several sheets, you know where you are looking at the address, so it's the uh, coordinates of the cells, then you have row, call, uh, is the cell blank, uh, this cell is not blank, this cell contains a character, um, so it doesn't have an error, it doesn't have a logical, etc. It contains a character. So maybe, you know, maybe let's look at, um, maybe let's look at this character, first of all, just typing, uh, okay, let's filter address equal equal a1 and let's pull out the character so let's see what was written in there let's see so timestamp so apparently um, on that cell we have something uh, we have this character chain timestamp great um, what about formulas because we're interested into formulas right so we have a col a column called formula so um, let's let's take a look. Um, you see that whenever you have, so in this case we have a character, so um, numeric would be an A. So if I'm looking at formulas, I would like to have every row 
where formula is not an A, right? So that would be the way to have the, um, the formulas. Let's maybe uh, do a head and let's maybe, yeah, let's maybe pull the formulas out just to take a quick look at what we're what we're getting. So we have this. These are the uh, first six formulas. Um, quite complex, especially the last ones over here. So it references apparently a sheet called data. Um, it uses some ifs, uh, some lookups. So pretty, pretty, pretty nice. So, um, if I want to count how many formulas I have, I could just, uh, I see that the video has stopped, uh, let me remove my non-moving face, you don't need that. Um, so, well, in this, let me zoom in, now that you don't need to see my face, so we have uh, 59,000 formulas in the first workbook, so that's, that's a lot. So now, how do I do that, well, how can I reads in all the Excel sheets and count the uh, formulas. So the way to do it is to simply in, you know, the basic uh, way to do it would be to write a for loop. So um, let's do that. So let's first of all start with our for instruction. And now, uh, now what? Oh, video is back. So I'm using DroidCam over over Wi-Fi, and I don't have very great Wi-Fi in my office, unfortunately. Um, so let's let's use. Uh, so let me think. So basically, I need to change this a little bit to make it work. Oh yeah, and I also need I also need an empty object to hold the results so I need to think a little bit about what's holding my results before I'm writing my loop and now I should be able to just say well the first or the ith result is going to be yeah and here I'm going to put this and this should do it so you see the um, you see how important it is to start with just one example, because the loop, what, whatever you're doing next, if you're writing a for loop, it's going to be almost exactly the same. So that's that's a nice thing. So let's run it. Takes a little bit of time because uh, those are some um, heavy spreadsheets. So let's look at the results. So very nice. I have this uh, vector with all the different uh, number of formulas in each workbook. Okay, so maybe what would be nice to have though is to not just have this vector without any names. So I don't know, I don't know, fifty-nine thousand formulas, but in which you know, in which uh, workbook. So what would be nice would be to also have the name there. So I need results to hold both the name and the result. So what I'm doing is I'm creating another object with two columns here. It's an array. So now results is an array of zeros. So I used a little trick here. So what I did was that I first, um, so I used as before the, I repeated zero uh, five times and then I see, I used cbind to uh, bind this vector with zero. So because they don't have the same dimensions, R automatically recycles the zero and makes it as large as needed to fill in the gaps. So you, you get this nice array with zeros there. So now that, now that I have that, I can say, well, I want the, um, what do I want? I want the first column to contain the name, right? And over here, up, I want the second column to contain the result. So that again should do it. Let's see. Again, it takes a little bit of time to run. When I started the video, when I was trying out, um, I had another workbook. So I just had one more, and it took so much longer. It was a huge workbook. So now. Oh, 
I was on the wrong layer. Results. So now, great, I have my results. So it's an array. So um, uh, it's a character uh, array, character ma matrix, uh, because the names, of course, are characters. So the, uh, new, the numbers get converted into characters automatically. However, I now know that this uh, G story uh, XLS file only has 121, and this one has zero formulas, which is quite interesting. That is really zero formulas is interesting. So I really wonder what this workbook contains. So you see, I mean, it was a stupid use case that I used, but I think there is legitim legitimately um, something interesting here. But okay, that's not the purpose of this video. So now, what? So this is a perfectly good way to do it, right? But I think there is a much better way. I think it's easier, more elegant, and much more flexible. And I will going. I'm, I'm going to show you that right now. So the first thing I would do, and this actually also uh, would work for loops, is I would write a function first of all. So the function would be something like count formulas. So it has a nice explicit name. It takes as an input, as an argument, it takes a workbook path or workbook name. Let's go with name. And now I basically copy this. So again, the importance of starting with one example, very important. And I just say, well, uh, I read in workbook name, I filter out my uh, formulas, and I count the rows. That's it. That's what this function does. And now, of course, I could use it inside the loop. Uh, you could do that. But what I'm going to use, I will use per map. So map, well, first of all, yeah, maybe maybe let me show you a little, a little example. So if I go from 1 to 10, and if I take a function, for example, the square root, what map is doing is it, it will apply square root, the function square root, to each element of the list that you give it. So in this case, it will... <laughs> now I'm stuck again. So let me remove because uh, I'm looking kind of creepy here. So square root of 1 is 1, square root of 2 is uh, this thing, square root of 3, square root of 4, and so on, and then uh, square root of 10. So it just applies this function to each element of, um, of, of the vector you have here. So in our case, what I'm going to do is, well, I have, you know, I have a list of Excel files, and I have a nice function that I wrote myself. So let's do that. Let's just run it. And that's it. Basically, map is a loop. It implements a loop, and you see that I get the exact same result as, in this case, uh, a list. But there are variants of map. You could write map DBL for double. So this will give you, uh, this will return you a, a vector of doubles, which is what the loop uh, gives you, the simple loop. Okay, that's great, but that's not exactly what we had before. Before we had some uh, nice result, which was this array with the names of the um, the names of the workbooks. So we can do that here as well. Actually, it's very easy. We could just say, well, these are the end formulas, right? And uh, what about this here? We would say, well. Um, well, actually, we don't even need another for another another thing. We already have the workbook name. So let's just put that in a data frame where we say workbook is workbook name, and where we say and formulas is and formulas. So this will create a data frame with one row where the the. Well, on the first column, you'll have the workbook name, and on the second column, you'll have how many formulas are in this workbook. So now, if I map this function to my list, what I will get is I will get a list of five data frames. You will see. Here, here it is. So 
I have this list of five data frames. So the first data frame just has one row, the second data frame just has one row, and it has exactly what I need. But that's a bit complex, right? It's a list of data frames. No problem. Instead of using map double, we're going to use map DFR, which is data frame and uh, R for bind rows, basically. So this thing will just return one single data frame where each um, single data frame of the list is now put together. So this thing is exactly what we had before. Actually, it's even better than what we had before because now it's a data frame. So you can do anything on it. You can uh, do some summary statistics much easier. You can filter, for example, if I'm interested into the workbooks that only contain, that don't have any formulas, I could do something like this. I could do well where, you know, n formulas is equal to zero. If you try to do that with the uh, thing we did before, it would be much more complex. It works, but it, we, it would be much more complex to do it with the loop. Or you would need to build this filter inside the loop. Uh, it's, not, it's not great. This is a, is, a, is, a, is a data frame, very normal data frame that you can export, that you could um, send to uh, a colleague, um, etc. So it's, it's much, much easier, much better. Um, just uh, a little detail, this map DFR, it's basically the same thing if you would then just, you know, do this, right? So you first have your, uh, so the first, the first line creates this list of data frames and then bind rows, just binds the rows uh, of all the, the, all the data frames. So this uh, map DFR is just a shorthand for for this uh, two steps over here. So that's how I uh, would do it. Um, there are other ways uh, to do that. So for example, um, I'm not going to show you because it's maybe a bit too complex for this particular use case, but you could start with a data frame where you would at first, you would go back to your, to your list over here and instead of having a list, you would put this directly in, into a data frame. So that would be the first column of your data frame. And then you would take this function and you would create a new column using this function and mutate. This is a bit more, more difficult. It is useful in certain cases to do it like this. But I think uh, for this use case over here, uh, what I showed you is probably the easiest way. So this is um, how I avoid writing loops. So again, I don't have anything against loops uh, as such. Loops are very useful, especially when there is recursion involved. So if you want to do something where the uh, nth step depends on the previous step, this is where loops uh, are really needed and useful. But if you just want to apply the exact same function like here over and over and over and over again, I think it's much easier just write a function that works for one element, for one workbook in this case, and then just map this function over your whole list. And that's it. Much easier, much faster, much more elegant. You don't need to think about this object result that will hold your results. You don't need to write so much code it's much better. Just, I would really advise you to think about uh, starting to use map and to think really in terms of functions. So everything you do should be a call to a function. It's much, much, much easier. Um, yeah, and uh, the other very nice thing is that uh, there is a version of per called fur um, that has a uh, version of map that runs in parallel. So if you have, for example, a thousand workbooks, you could using fur, so it's, it's, let me show you, it's fur, and I think it is called future, yeah, future map. So this thing, future map, is the same thing as before but it runs in, in parallel. You just have the, so if I, if I run it like this, it will just run on one core of my computer. 
but if I declare beforehand that I want to use four cores or I think if no I'm not mistaken it's plan if I, I think it's plan multi process oh, maybe yeah I need to start fur before Oop, yeah that's it and now plan multi process for example let's go with four cores now this should run uh, well it should but for some reason it's running weird sequential for some reason it's running in sequential sequential mode I don't know why but anyway um, fur is a uh, is a is a multi-processor version parallel version of, of per so you can literally just take your code and just just run it over four or six cores or whatever how many cores you have so in this case it I don't think it worked because here he's calling about he's talking about sequential so maybe multi-process because there's several types of ways to declare plans so maybe multi-process is not the right way on Linux I don't remember actually now um, which which I, I use in general anyway if you want to re rewrite this loop to run over multiple cores it's a bit more complex so there's this nice package which I don't remember how it's called now but there's a package that allows you to do that to um, run your loops in parallel but you really have to rewrite it quite a lot so it is uh, a bit more work it is a bit more work to rewrite this loop to run in parallel than to just literally replace map with future map and call the right plan so i hope you enjoyed um really think about this uh, about this way of working i think it's much better much easier than uh, using loops see you next time